what I heard was, and I'm going to be sharing from several different things, um, sources as well as some things he's given me directly, and sometimes I do this, sometimes I don't, but um, what I heard was this passage, I know that you love me. And that can sound like a very simple thing. But to know that you know that you know. I mean, really know that he loves you. And there's always the place to go deeper now. I don't care how deep we go. The invitation is always. I love that song that Kevin Cross sings about we plant our lives in the soil of God's love and we watch it grow and bloom. I just love that. Um, if I was a painter, I would definitely, every time I hear that song, I think, oh, if I was a painter, I would paint that because it's so profound. But one of my, as you all know, favorite authors is David Adams. And um, he wrote this. God, I am at peace because you enfold me. I come now to rest in your protecting. Nothing can separate us. I know that you love me. And that changes everything. In your presence, troubles fade. And all anxieties decrease. I dwell in you, in you and me. I am already in your kingdom. And so when I, as so many of my messages begin with me, <laughs> I was reading this and it was like, this just blew off the page. I know that you love me and that changes everything. And that is just absolutely profoundly true. The love of God changes everything in our lives. But it continues to change it. It's the John 3.16 encounter that continues to be, you know, the transforming again and again and again and again. And I wanted to share, I'm going to sort of, as I always do, sort of move here, there, and everywhere. I'm going to um, read something else. Um, there is, there is, when I read this, these five places that um, we can hide, that can separate us from God's love. And sometimes we, we really need to let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Things that, in this area of our life, we're wide open. But there's another areas that we don't even see sometimes. And he says, I really want you to look. So again, when I was reading this, I, this was just my devotion, I was reading this for me. And the Lord said, okay, God, you know, no, this is part of this message, and it's also what I'm doing in your own life. So let's just look at this. He writes this, Lord, you are my light and my salvation. You walk with me in the hidden places of my life, the dark places where I am afraid to walk alone. So what is one of the places that we can hide from the God, from the love of God. We can have hidden places. We can have dark places um, where um, we hide these places from the Lord and where we're, we, we can be afraid. Like we're afraid to walk alone. We're afraid to be alone. We're afraid in the midst of the circumstance where I need the light of your presence and your love. And this is the place that we need him to come and shine the light of his presence and his love in these hidden places, in these dark places. And we often don't even know them. It's God himself who is light, that shines his light into a hidden place, into a dark area, and says, did you, did you see that? My love is so tender towards you. It's okay, but I just want to show that to you. And we can be used to help somebody else see it. You know what I'm saying? Because we need each other. And he goes on to write, Lord, are you are my, my light and my salvation. You walk with me in the hidden rooms of shame. There's the next place. The hidden rooms of shame. Oh, I don't have any shame. You know, I'll have somebody say that to me, and then I'll sit and have a conversation with them. It's like shame is all over the place. But they don't see it. And we often don't see it because it becomes so familiar to us. You know, like a chair we sit on, it's familiar. You know, or friends we're around, it's familiar. But shame can be hidden in rooms of our heart. That all of a sudden we're in a, we're in a circumstance and like something holds us back. And all of a sudden we realize by God's grace it's shame. 
And so in this hidden room of shame, he says, where I need forgiveness and renewal. So hidden in dark places, we need his light and his presence and his love. In the hidden rooms of shame, we need the, his forgiveness and his renewal. Because nothing is beyond his reach. Lord, you are my light and my salvation. You walk with me in the troubled depth of my being. Have you ever had those things that come up and all of a sudden your entire being you feel troubled? I mean, it's like your entire being is in troubled. And when that begins to take place with us, you know, God is again pointing that out to us. You are troubled in the depth of your being. And that which is supposed to rule that place is peace. That which is supposed to rule that place is my presence and my calm. So he writes, where I need your peaceful presence and calm. And in the world we live today, in the hours that we're getting into, when things are getting darker, if ever we need the peace of God in our heart and the calmness, be still and know that I am God. It is now. And it is a place that we can not just visit, but live in. Then that's the third place. The fourth place that can separate us from God's love is, you walk with me in my store of hurtful memories. Wow. You know, I listen to people. People can say to me, oh, I'm healed of that. But I listen in the spirit. And I can hear the hurt as they share their memories. There may be a smile, maybe trying to be a cheerful story as you share it. But when you listen with the spirit, when you listen with your heart, you can feel the hurt in the memory. And we can be convinced that we're healed of it. And we may be to a point, but God often heals in different measures and layers. It's like, okay, it's happened to me. I thought that was dealt with. Well, it was to that degree. But now you're ready to go deeper. Do this all? Be tracking sure. with this? And so the last place we're going to touch before I move on is you walk with me and accept me as I am. You cleanse me from my secret faults. Have any secret faults? You know, there's places that I think most people, if they admit, they don't share it with anybody. No, absolutely nobody. Not even their mates. Nobody but God. And that's okay. There's some things we just share with God. We don't have to share them with anybody else. It's just God. It's those things that are very secret, very deep. It's our faults. It's our things. There's things that I'll say to God and I'll say, I can't not believe, Father, that I did that again. I can't. It may be the smallest thing, but it grieves my heart. It can be a tone. It can be the slightest thing. It's usually a slight thing. But that slight thing, I feel grief in my heart. And I feel grief in my heart. Not from I'm being accused by anybody or anything. I feel that I grieved his heart. And that grieves my heart. He hasn't rejected me. He hasn't looked away from me. He loves me exactly the same. But I feel that little grief. It's like, you didn't represent me properly. Can we talk about it? Yes, Father, I do want to talk about it. I can't believe I did it again. It's okay, daughter. Come closer. Because it's in my presence I transform it. And I'm just really happy that you paid attention. And so you see, it's the place you continue to walk in his celebration and his love. You don't run from him. You can share those secret thoughts. You can share that. And God is really, it's, pre it's precious that we do have those that we can share, you know, things with like this. That's so important in our life. So those are five things that I just wanted and felt to share. Five things that can separate us, um, you know, from his love or can keep us a little bit further away than perhaps he wants us to be. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share some things from David Adam and others that I really love different things that have really touched my life. And I don't always do this because I'm not trying to come in and give a book report. You know, it's like, oh, I'll just go read this book. But I'm not trying to 
sell your book or try to bring forth some things that God is really using to shape my life and, and share them with you, if that's okay. Um, one of the things that I really love is this quote by David Adam that says, Joy-filled people are radiant people. And is that not true? Are you not drawn to a radiant, joy-filled face? And it's like a magnet you can't not want to be, right, Jen? It's like, you know? It's like, wow, what is going on in that person's life that they just radiate? And I love this quote by John Osborne. He says this, How I long for just a little ordinary human enthusiasm, just enthusiasm, that's all, I want to hear a warm, thrilling voice cry out, Hallelujah, I'm alive. Oh, brother, it's such a long time since I was with anyone who got enthusiastic about anything. Why do you feel with enthusiasm? you too much. But, you know, I feel like that sometimes. It's like, ah, is there anybody who just, like, has life that, like, wants to, like, look loud? It's a brand new day. You know, it's like, yeah, it's been a crazy bit of a day, but it still is an amazing day because God was with me. You know, it's, we become who, like who we're around. And so, we're not around people like that, then we need to be that. So we become contagious. Um, he goes on to say, there's always something thrilling about being with enthusiastic people who show commitment, who show love, who show joy in what they do. That I truly seem alive and full of energy with the light in your eyes. And you can't fake light, the light of God in your eyes. You can fake a lot of things, but you can't fake the light of God in your eyes, and you can't fake the love of God in your eyes. It's impossible. Because when he's in you, and he's radiating out through you, he comes through your, it comes through your eyes. The word enthusiasm is actually um, a Greek word, and it means being in God. How's that? So enthusiasm, really, the root word of it is being in God. Because true enthusiasm that is lasting is not for a moment for an event, you follow what I'm saying, or something that we're doing. Enthusiasm is really a gift of God in our soul, in our spirit man, that propels us and compels us because he has given us the very enthusiasm in his heart. Being with him, being in God, God in us. I mean, it's just so powerful. We could go on and on um, just about that. Um, you never, um, Bertram Dobell says this, you never enjoy the world aright till you so love the beauty of enjoying it. And you are covetous and earnest to persuade others to enjoy it. So, you know, I just, it's one of the things I love about the early morning and walking my dog and hearing the birds and just the dawn. The quietness of an early morning. Because you can begin your day just really thanking God, meditating on Him, and allowing the love and the joy of God to fill your heart and to begin your day with thanksgiving. You know, I don't go and look at my day timer first thing in the, in, in the day. I don't want to even think about it. I don't want to begin my day like, ah, I want to think my day. You know, have my day because I want to be one of those joy-filled people who are radiant every place I go. And so, that to me is one of my goals for um, for this year is to just really walk in this new, this fresh place of joy. Another quote I love, and I know I'm throwing a lot of quotes at you, but that's okay because it's just what I feel like doing tonight. Your enjoyment of the world is never right. Till every morning you awake in heaven, see your, yourself in your father's palace, look upon the skies, the earth, and the air as celestial joys. How's that to begin your day? Awake in the morning. How about this day when you wake in heaven, you see yourself in your father's palace, and you look upon the skies, the earth, and the um, stars, and you just see the celestial love of God. Come on. How's that to start your day? You don't need coffee. <laughs> you don't need Jesus. I'm not saying you drink coffee. You don't. I don't care. I mean, I do. But it's, it's not to wake me up. I can assure you that. I'm already awake. But. <laughs> drive people crazy. Ah, she's awake. Psalm 43. Um, How's 
this? How's this to begin your day? Pour into me the brightness of your daybreak. Pour into me your rays of revelation truth. Let that comfort and gently lead me onto the shining path, showing the way into your burning presence, into your many sanctuaries of holiness. Then I will come closer to your very altar until I come before you, the God of my ecstatic joy. I will praise you with the harp that plays in my heart. You ever think about that? We have a harp that plays in our heart, Cherish, that he blows his breath, the breath of his love and his desire. He blows his breath across on the harp of our hearts and a song comes forth of celestial joy of his goodness and his love. Come on, are we gonna let the morning birds outdo us? I mean, come on! I don't know, I mean, I'm really stuck and I'm like, what? The brightness of your baby, your rain, the revolution, come on now! A harp in my heart, that's awesome! Because I've always wanted to play a harp. So I can't play the natural, come on, blow your brain! Let the chords come on! Isn't that fun? I mean, God is so fun! I don't know about this boring stuff, forget that. I mean, we get to find the fun of knowing God. I mean, forget that religion. The 
joy, even when life is tough, really tough. It's his joy that gets us through. How can you be laughing in the midst of that? I'll share with you, Monica, something that the Lord has dropped in my heart because this dance, dance is everything. When my husband passed away eight years ago, I did his service. I did his memorial service. I'm standing in the pew, and the Lord said, I want you to get out and worship me. And I'm like, I mean, I do it all. I've always been crazy and dancer and whatever, you know, all the stuff. I just do whatever he wants. But I'm like, well, Lord, this is like a whole place is filled. Many people don't know the Lord. I mean, that's never stopped me before, but, you know, this is memorial service. No, I want you to get up. So I go over in the corner. No, no, no. I said up front. Oh, you know, key. And so up here, and part of our worship team that we, you know, that we had, they were doing the worship. And then he said, now, what I'm going to ask you next is going to determine how you process this and how you walk and live in this for the rest of your life. What you do right now. I want you to dance with abandonment for me. A dance of thankfulness. I want you to honor me. I want you to thank me. I want you to offer the sacrifice of dance and praise and worship before me. A couple of people left the room. They were so offended. So offended. People that it blew me away as I did a spin and saw them. One, did a spin. Two, three, and off they go. And challenged later. What the heck was that? I said, what the heck was that? That was called the dance that Jesus asked of me. Because it would determine the rest of my life. And for that dance, he put in my heart joy instead of money. power of worship, the power of thanksgiving. Did I have to process through? Of course, but I didn't live in a crippled place. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because of that. I'm not boasting on me. I'm just telling you that's what the Lord asked. And so Psalm 100, this is an invitation from God. Um, Lift up a great shout of joy to the Lord. Go ahead and do it. Everyone everywhere, bring your gift of laughter to him and be glad as you worship him. Sing your way into his presence with joy. Try to realize what this really means. We get to worship the Lord our God. He is our creator and now we belong to him. For we are the people of his pleasure. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. How about singing your way into his presence with joy? This is the invitation from God because what it says is this. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. People of his pleasure, a password of praise, passing through the open gate to what? To be amazed, to be astonished, to be filled with joy, to be lavished with his love, and to lavish him back. I mean, I know this is all familiar, but I don't know about you. I love to just go deeper in it. We have to keep ourselves like, go back into the depths of the ocean again. Let's not just walk on the trees, you know, splashing our little toes in the water. No! Come on, take off the stupid teeth and jump in! <laughs> You know, you get your feet a little wet. No, no, no. You know, let's just, just jump right in the water of God's love. Amen. And so, Matthew um, 17. Did I bring Matthew? Yes. Thank you, God. Um, oh, you're, is this okay? Are you tracking with me? Am I yes. Just rambling away. And, <laughs> is it over yet? <laughs> I'm really trying not to talk. Just to talk. I really. Um, A very, again, familiar passage, Matthew 17. And it's when Jesus took um, Peter, you know, James and John up the mountain to be alone. And it says, Jesus' appearance was dramatically altered. A radiant light, as bright as the sun, poured from his face. How about that? You know? And his clothing became luminescent, dazzling like lightning. And he was transfigured before their very eyes. 
And then suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and they spoke with Jesus and Peter blurted out, Peter was always blurting out, you know, <laughs> Lord, it's so wonderful we're all here together. If you want, I will construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah.
This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, as you live a satisfying and perfect, perfect in his eyes. Perfect in his eyes. Isn't that amazing? Perfect in his eyes. Because we've already been made perfect by the blood of Christ. You know, that's something we really have to get. You know, what has really happened to us by the blood of the Lamb. And so, you know, it's this place of constantly focusing on Him, constantly listening to Him, and by the way, listening to each other. Because the art of listening is so missing in our society. I'm telling you, I'm getting ready to start putting in my house, leave your cell phones out at the door, please. We'll have little check-in slots. And everybody can leave them right there, so everybody's focused. I'm being really serious. Out there. Shut them off. Put them away. In conversations. When you go places. I don't want to see a cell phone out. People are checking everything. When I'm at dinner, you follow what I'm saying? Unless it's an emergency. People aren't paying attention. We are, we are everywhere. But I'll tell you what. If I'm with you, unless there's an emergency, what is more important? If I've set a time to be with her, her, for every text, Wherever email I think I have to get. Guess what? I am not that important. Right now, if I'm with her, this is what's important. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad or put anything down. It's the art of listening that is being lost from our society and relationships. All your friends on Facebook, I've got 5,000 friends. No, you don't. You have people who are signed up on some media page. Maybe some of your friends. You know what I'm saying? Living through whatever because of the lack of really close listening, looking, dialoguing, hearing. The art of listening, and you can tell when somebody's listening to you. You can tell whether they're all over the place or they're really paying attention in listening to you. And if we can't listen to each other, how are we going to listen to God? Just a thought. You may want to consider it. I can't tell you I have arrived, but I am working to really listen. Really listen. Listen with my ears and listen with the ears of my heart and my spirit. So, now that we had that little thing, I wasn't planning on saying that, only about the art of listening. But I want to look at another familiar passage. Um, because tonight's message is all about I know that you love me in what love looks like and what it sounds like and what it means. Love means I listen to you. That's what love means. I listen to you. You matter. You have value. And so, here's another example of love. Again, I'm just reading this for myself and all of a sudden I'm going, wow, that's really powerful. So, you know, Paul the Apostle um, you know, he goes and he preaches everywhere, but now he's back and he's, uh, he's visiting um, this group of people in, in Troas, where we stayed on, on for another week. On Sunday, we gathered to take communion and to hear Paul preach. Because he was planning to leave the next day, he continued speaking until past midnight. Many flickering lamps burned in the upstairs chamber where we were meeting. Sitting in an open window, listening, was a young man named Lucky. As Paul's sermon dragged on, Lucky became drowsy and fell into a deep slumber. Sound asleep, he fell three stories to his death below. Now this is a hungry guy. He's up till midnight, sitting in a window and falls out, okay? Paul went downstairs, bent over the boy, embraced him, Taking him in his arms, he said to all the people gathered, Stop you worrying, he's come back to life. Went back upstairs, served communion, ate a meal with them, picked back up where he left off, talked until dawn, filled with enormous joy. They took the boy home alive, and everyone was encouraged. Now that is the front hot headlines for the Boston Globe, Boston Times, and whatever else. Preacher preaches to midnight. Boy falls out the window. Paul goes down and he wraps him in the arms of blood. Life, the compassion of Jesus 
pulled through him. He didn't have to, ah, he just went down, wrapped him in his arms of love. The resurrection power and love of Jesus fills him. And what? Did he go, oh no, he's like, what are we going to do? No, he just got thrown from his head. Back upstairs, he preached till dawn, and they all left with joy. Now that's a gathering of the body of Christ. That is like wild and crazy, isn't that?
which flows from your relationship with Jesus, the anointed one. Then, here we go, with a unanimous rush of passion, you will be one, with one voice, glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that powerful? A unanimous rush of passion. You will be one voice, with one voice, glorify God. You will bring God glory when you accept and welcome one another as partners, just as the anointed one has fully accepted you and received you as his partner. So, you know, my, the point that really stood out there for me was this unanimous rush of passion that comes in from the heart of God. It's like God just opens up his heart and he just goes, and he fills this room. He fills our hearts with passion. And we become, we come into this place of one voice that glorifies God. And then how we bring glory when we accept each other as partners. And how do we do that? I'll tell you how we do that only one way. Because we are convinced that we are fully accepted by him. Not partly. Well, he loves this part of me, but he doesn't like this part of me. Oh, I know he loves me, but, you know, he can't really love that about me. No, when we know we are 100% fully accepted just the way we are on our journey becoming more and more like Christ. We open wide our hearts, pour your passion in Jesus. He pours it in. We pour it out to each other. We become one in the spirit. And then we give him this great glory because we are one. Why? Because we don't have any striving or competition or jealousy or envy. Oh, it may knock at your door. The question is, do you let it in? You follow what I'm saying? Or is it from within out? But if it comes knocking at you, do it. That's not the problem. You're just like, get out. There's no room for you here. We got the passion of Jesus running through this place. Isn't that powerful? Because once again, everybody's trying to have these unity. We're going to come and be unified. Like God's been, don't you go to these whatever things, you know, you love these things and everybody from every different faith, whatever, you know, I believe in Allah and I believe in and all these things. We're all going to come together. It's like, no. I don't agree with any of that. No, I can't. I don't agree with it. There's only one God. So there is a, it's false. That can't happen. It's this false, this unity that people want to come together. I'm not condemning anybody, but there's, there's one God. I'm sorry, but there is. And so that can't happen. That will not bring God glory because that's false. It's not true. True unity is around his throne. Um, not around man's ideas, but around his throne. And so in verse 13, he talks and he says, Now may God, the inspiration and the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with uncontainable joy and perfect peace as you trust in him. And may the power of the Holy Spirit continually surround your life with his superabundance until you radiate with hope. Now there's one for your refrigerator, your car dashboard, the work room at the ladies room at work. <laughs>
God. There it is again. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. And since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes life into you. So, there it is again. He imparts his life to us over and over again because we are fully accepted by God. Oh my gosh, that is so powerful. You know, what is the air we breathe? You know, he breathes life into us. Every time we come to him, he breathes his life, his resurrection life into us. Why? Because he is the resurrected one. There is no other breath he can breathe. He's constantly, when we're in his presence, you know, take it. Receive my resurrection breath into you. You know, but the enemy wants to breathe an atmosphere of lies around our lives. Lies, accusations, deception. Oh my gosh, you know, you're nothing, whatever. I mean, he just breathes all this stuff. And if he, if he doesn't do it himself, he'll use somebody else, you know, to just try and change the atmosphere of our lives into this place of wrong thinking, you know, but he proved his love. Um, it says in Romans 8.31, Using a lot of the scripture tonight, which is really good. The triumph of God's love. So what does all this mean? If God is determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen and loved to be his? God himself is the judge who has issued his final verdict over them. Not guilty. Not guilty. You see, what's the verdict we live on? The lies of the enemy? <laughs> Maybe friends or parents or bosses or whatever, you know what I'm saying? People, circumstances. But there is like there is a flag, the banner of his love. It says in Song of Songs that we live under. There is also the edict. What he has declared and decreed. Because he so loves us. Not to get to That is freedom. That's freedom. Because in that... If he was to step into this room tonight, you could walk right up to him and go straight in his face. Not because we're perfect. Not because we have arrived. Because we are fully accepted. Because he has declared we are his and not guilty. That you can take to the bank. And the world collapses and the economy starts to fall apart and the world starts to go crazy. That you can take to the bank. The bank accounts of heaven. Where the things that are eternal and last forever can never be touched or taken um, away from us. The final verdict, I mean, that was like that needs to be made into a movie. Just that one scene. I mean, come on. Just powerful. This is so, so, such powerful. Amazing. <clears throat> Let's go on <clears throat> to that passage. Very familiar, but I love to look at the familiar things again. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one, it says. For nothing in the universe has the power to, just, to diminish his love towards us. Troubles? Nope. Pressures? Nope. Problems? Nope. It says are unable to come between us and heaven's love. <clears throat> what about persecutions? What about deprivations? What about dangers and death threats? Nope. They all are impotent to hinder 
omnipotent law. So now I live with the confidence. He is the key. I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. Convinced, absolutely confident. Then it goes on to say, I'm convinced. So first he's confident. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, over life's troubles, over fallen angels, dark rulers of the heavens, that there's nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. He notice it's all about his love. God's love, his love, didn't say our love, his love. So, he's confident that nothing can separate. He's convinced that love triumphs, his love. Then, there's no power above us, beneath us, no power that can be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. So, he's confident that nothing separates. He's convinced that his love triumphs, that nothing can weaken God's love, and that there's no power that can distance us from God's passionate love. Not just God's love, but God's passionate love. Um, I think that's what, what sometimes, you know, it's like God really has to be displayed with the emotions that he has. It's like God is this little whatever, sterile figure in white on a throne, you know, and he sort of looks over the earth and does whatever, you know. No, he's passionate. He has emotions. Jesus has emotions. The emotions of God, to study the emotions of God is an amazing study. The emotions of God. And that's why he said David had a, was a, had a heart after him. Because David was this passionate, emotional, you know, dancing wild guy, you know. And God loved that about him. And he loved, God, God loves passion because he's passionate and he puts his passion in us. So it's not like we go to the world with this message of, you know, bug up around. No, it's like, hey, this is God who's crazy about you. He's like crazy, passionate. Why is this nobody, you know? I mean, I know love, I've been loved on earth, but I'll tell you what, there is no love like the love of God. No, no love like the love of God. The only love that you know will never leave, <coughs> will never forsake you. When that love comes into, you know, other relationships, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we're back to the Acts 20, you know, where the kid fell out the window and get raised from the dead, and they all had this whole all night long time. And so now Paul's getting ready to leave them. And after Paul finished speaking, he knelt down and prayed with them. Then they all cried with great weeping as one another hugged Paul and kissed him. What broke their hearts the most were his words, you will not see my face again. And they tearfully accompanied Paul back to the ship. You know what that's on the top of every pastor's teaching messages, David, right? <laughs> Acts 20, verse 36. Well, it was to me. Because it says, what broke their hearts the most were his words, you will not see my face again. Why? Because that face was a face that was radiant with love and joy and acceptance and speaking into their lives and building them up. Think how much he had to share that he began to speak at dusk and spoke until dawn. That's crazy. That's wild. Think of what he poured into them. That they would sit that long because he was so alive with life and love and joy. And he was the ambassador of God's heart. And the time that he was with them, that when it came time, would broke their hearts, broke their hearts. Not just, oh, we're not going to see him again. Next! Which I see so much of, sorry. Next! No. 
God forbid that we could be so quick. Next, next friend, next pastor, next leader, next husband, next whatever. No, next friend, no, not next. Because true koinonia is I can't live my life without you. That is true koinonia love. That's what they were saying here. We know we have to. We know you have to go on. In this place, you have to go on. But our heart is broken because we love being with you face to face. You say, that's what it is when you have true koinonia, 12 or 200 or whatever it may be. They actually say you can't have two point in the year past 120 because you can only process so much with so many people. You can then break off into smaller groups and find it there, if all I'm saying. But it is not, oh, it's so nice to see you. Kissy, kissy, honey, honey. Hope to see you next week. Have a good week. <laughs> you don't know anything about it. I'm not criticizing that, but is that point in Neo? No. That's acquaintance. That's high. How you do it. But it's like, how really are you? How really is your life? That we know that with each other matters, that it cares. That my life wouldn't be the same if the people in this room weren't in it. My heart would break if we couldn't see them face to face. As my heart breaks that we can't see Dan right now because he can't cross the border. There's that ache. There's that ache in my heart that we aren't able to see Dan um, because of the, some of the things with the, with the borders right now. So 1 Corinthians 13, the message, I'm not going to read the whole thing, just four little passages. I got this from the, the, the message version. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. The best of the three is love. I'll say it again. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly and love extravagantly. That's um, really powerful stuff. David Adams wrote um, in the Hebrides, and I know that I've spoken to you about this many times, the Celtic Church, which is just a passion of mine, the Celtic Church, and the way that they walk with God. And on the Hebridean Islands, um, they had these really close koinonia communities where they really did. Everybody lived in common. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they had their own homes and things. Some lived in bigger places. But they were really a close-knit. They came and formed communities based around their faith. And Many of them were illiterate, and they learned the Psalms, and they learned the Bible, and they learned singing, and they sang them to each other, as I've taught many times. So this one Hebridean woman said this, my mother would be asking us to sing our morning song to God down in the bathhouse, as Mary's lock was singing it up in the clouds. And as the Mavis thrush song, thrush song thrush was singing it yonder in the tree, giving glory to God of the creatures for the repose of the night, for the light of the day and the joy of life, she would tell us that every creature on the earth here below and in the ocean beneath and in the air above was giving glory to the great God of the creatures and the worlds, of the virtues and the blessings, and would we be done? Or would we be silent? It goes on to talk about serving the Lord with gladness and how, again, these Celtic um, Christians enjoyed working in God's presence and for God's glory. So they had a song for everything. Milking the cows, starting the fire, putting the fire out, putting the kids to bed as they made the stew, when they walked the sheep out to the pasture. Everything was done with a song of joy and celebration and inviting God to be in their midst and to walk with them. And so these were songs that kept them in constant communion and dialogue with the Lord because they learned, David, what it was to work in God's presence, enjoying working in God's presence, 
and enjoying living their lives for God's glory. That was the place of in Him we live. In Him we move. In Him we have our being. There are compartments. There is this rhythm. There is this way that they learned the place of being with Him and in His joy and in His presence and in His love that they will, if you would, live in this place of communion and came into that place of that union, that oneness with God. That too often can wait until we come together in a gathering such as this, when God intended it for it to be um, as he puts it here, the joy of ecstatic celebration. Each and every day of our lives is to be walked in the joy of ecstatic celebration. I love this by G.K. Chesterton. You say grace before meals, all right, but I say grace before the play and the opera. I say grace before the concert and the pantomime. And grace before I open a book. I say grace before sketching and painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing, and grace before I dip the pen in the ink. Coming to his presence with a song is an invitation and represents one of the easier ways of enjoying and rejoicing in God. Know that God awaits your return in love. He's always waiting for us to come back to him again and again, afresh every single day. So I want to skip it over a bunch of stuff because I want to bring us to where I want to just lay on this. Um, again, I'm going to share something that David Allen wrote. It is almost impossible for a thankful heart to be sad to be a sad heart. And the ability to count our blessings can move us out of emptiness, out of boredom, and into joy. From him we come. In him we are enfolded. To him we return. We shall find in him our whole heaven in everlasting joy. In this endless love, man's soul is kept safe. In this endless love, we are led and looked after and never lost. For he wills that we should know our soul to be alive. And that this life, through his goodness and through his grace, shall continue in heaven without end, loving him, thanking him and praising him. That was by Julian of Norwich, another one of my favorite authors. From him we come. In him we are enfolded. To him we return. And in him we find our everlasting joy. Now, where I want to end is I would like us to actually engage in a couple of things. There is this place that, a progression that I really believe God invites us into. And it's one of the things that 
the Celtic Church really found from this place of deep communion with God. And it's this natural progression to where they really learned to rest. To rest in God. And I don't mean lying down and snoring asleep. I mean, I'm talking rest. You know when you know when you're at you're at rest? You're at rest when your mind is still. Doesn't mean it's absent of thought, but it's still, it's not racing. When you're not, oh, my neck's killing me. Why? Because you've been like that all day. You're not even wear it. People sleep like that at night. You follow what I'm saying? None of this is a criticism. It happens. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because why? Because we're not at rest. You may think we are. But our body doesn't lie, and our mind doesn't lie. It's going like this, we're not at rest. Again, we're not blank, but our thoughts are ordered. Our thoughts are peaceful. Our thoughts are moving with God. We have his thoughts. Our souls to be at rest, our hearts to be at peace. And that peace overrules and governs our lives. And so there's this place of a natural progression where we learn to rest. When we learn that place of rest, it leads us to a place of greater seeing. We see God. We see Him in people. We see His Word differently. We see life differently. We see with the eyes of our heart and we see in the Spirit also. From that seeing, it goes to the place of knowing. Knowing who we are, who we are, Knowing him in a greater capacity. Knowing whose we are. It's this knowing, it's the revelation, knowledge of God that comes into us. Because we're able to receive it. Because our eyes are being opened from this place of rest. Our ears, our heart is being opened. Our mind is being opened in this place of rest. So now we're moving from knowing and knowing God and being known of God to loving Loving in ways we never thought that we could love. And receiving his love. And then from that loving to enjoying, where we are filled with joy. And we live in joy. I mean, every day, they didn't feel like getting up and milking cows. But they found this place where they lived in joy. When you live in joy, even the mundane things can become joyful. Because you have a song in your heart. And that song changes everything that we do. Um, and so, what I'd like to do is I'd like us to just go there. Okay? So I'd just like everybody to close their eyes. Because I don't want you looking at me or anybody else. And I just want you to be still and quiet. Now pay attention to every part of your body and where there is any place of tension just ask the Lord for his rest to come in I'm going to move through this quickly, but this is something that I have, you know, learned to do. Not every, exactly everything like this. I'm just trying. I, I just 
have learned a way to bring myself into God's presence. To still your mind now with a single phrase or affirmation of God's presence. And it could be something like this. Lord, you are here and you are rejoice. Or whatever it is that you would want to speak to the Lord, but we don't still our minds with commanding it to be still. We still it by meditating upon the Lord. So a phrase or an affirmation about his presence. And let that passage or that phrase begin to fill your whole being. Don't say it once. Continue to say it from your heart to his. Listen for just one word, one phrase, or just one sense of his presence. Listen for what he might whisper to you tonight from his heart to you. your heart to his. That which is between you and him. Your loving God, your loving Lord. in that place, if you will, I'm just going to close with a few final things that keep us in that same flow. I just want to talk a few more minutes about resting in this. We need to really look for opportunities to rest, to see, to know, to love, to enjoy. And as David Adams put, occasions for alleluia. That's where this comes from, his book, Occasions for Alleluia. Knowing that each occasion is an opportunity for me and God. 
every occasion in our life, every situation, opportunity to meet God. We need to look for them. And that it is an occasion for an hour as I had around, you know, just somebody with enthusiasm, somebody that would, you know, it's an hallelujah moment. Every moment can be an hallelujah moment. I don't, I'm not saying, oh, you know, I mean, there's tragedy, there's trials, there's tribulations, but in our heart, we may not be shouting hallelujah, but in your heart, there is peace and joy in us in the midst of it. And so, resting. What that means is building times of rest into our day. And that's making space for God. Um, going deeper into that we dwell in Him and He dwells in us. When it says, you know, seeing Him. Um, that's teaching ourselves to look with the eyes of our hearts. And as I said before, giving undivided attention to the people that we come in contact with. And even, you know, giving full attention to, well, you know, there's a bird in my bird feeder. No, like really looking at that bird in your bird feeder. You know what I'm saying? Like really giving up. We just sort of, we can flutter. I don't know. Am I the only one? I mean, you can just like, I can go on a walk and the little say, did you even see anything? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Father, I didn't. And all of a sudden, now pay attention. And I'll start to look at everything. Focus at every flower. Stop and take a picture. You know what I'm saying? It's like you take it in because you're focusing. We shall know to know. Um, this is not just book knowledge. It's knowing God. A personal relationship. Um, you know, that's so deep with him. Not just about him. All kinds of people can say all types of things they know about him. But to know him. What God spoke to me. This is what I spoke to him. That's very different than this is what I read. We shall love, giving thanks for all the people who have given their love to you, people who sacrificed for you, care for you, um, and returning that love. And lastly, um, we shall praise. Coming each day into his presence with thanksgiving. Um, and celebrating God and his love. Let all be amen and alleluia until all of life is an occasion for alleluias. I just love that. This book is really a profound book that I've been studying for the past few months. I'd like to end with a poem that he wrote. And, uh, It's called Unaware. Lord, I have been looking for you, not realizing that you are already with me. I sought you in books and lectures. When you tried to talk with me, I spoke too much in my prayers. When you asked me to be still, I ran around still searching for you. I sought your dwelling place, not knowing that I dwell in you and that you abide in me. You enfold me in your love, and you encompass my days. All there is dwells in your presence. You are found in all things. Lord, teach me to be still, to rest, and to rejoice. each one of us <coughs> will come into a place tonight that your love has gone really deeper, deep enlarged within our hearts more and that that love your love changes everything from the most hopeless situation 
the wildest dream we dare to live out. I pray that your encompassing love, that love that surrounds us, your encompassing love, may it be as a cloud, may it be as a blanket wrapped in your love. That as each one leaves, that as each one goes home, as as each one lays their head in their pillow tonight, may there be a deeper rest, a deeper peace, a greater joy, a greater confidence, a greater knowing. And Lord, cause us to every day venture deeper into your love. May every day be a reason for an alleluia. And I pray that our faces truly will radiate joy from the place of knowing we are loved by you with a passionate love. And I pray this in the powerful and magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.